they were reminded that together that they should bring word or testimony, they should bring a psalm, a song on their lips, something uh, to help build up the body, build each other up. And so as we have, dear, what has God been saying to you this week? Has anyone got anything they would like to share on the goodness of God over the last week or so that they'd like to share uh, anyone, anyone at all? Thanks, Sandy. You right, Sandy? They don't deserve a chocolate yet. Just, I, I do actually, I, I will acknowledge our uh, recording crew down here. Where William was us out, which is great. Um, Jude's son and uh, Eskew, of course. How wonderful that they're putting together our recording this morning. So it's good to have them here. You can't see them, they're hidden behind their little cupboard. But Sandy just gave them a chocolate. So there we go. Let's stand.
if you lift up my name before me and I will lift up your name before the Father. So Lord, we lift up your name. We recognise you as our King and our Saviour. We recognise, Lord, that you gave up your life for us to fulfil Scripture, to make that one perfect sacrifice for the sin of the world. That's for us, each of us, by name. Your name is lifted up and exalted. Thank you, Lord. that again. I don't know if this is for anyone here or for anyone online, but I get a clear picture of somebody standing in what you'd call a foyer, I suppose, in a foyer, staring at a revolving door, thinking that if they step into that revolving door, they're just going to end up going round and round and round in the same place, not recognising that if you actually follow the revolving door, you can actually get out of the circumstance that you find yourself in now. So the Lord would say, step in, and as the door moves around, so you will find the exit out of the position, the situation you're in. Trust me, says the Lord. I believe that's a word for someone. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.
Please be seated. Thank you. Thanks, Sandy. Sorry? Mm-hmm. Father, may the words that I speak, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Had choices of subjects to preach on this morning, which was cool. One of them felt a bit sort of Pentecostal. But it's so not not Pentecostal. That's, oh, oh, I'm sorry to my brothers watching. Uh, uh, anyway, I'm not going to fall into that. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. Not Pentecostal. It was actually something that was mentioned at Pentecost, which I'm thinking is a few weeks ahead of us yet. But how I was going to be looking at it was from the position of the understanding that God is... I struggled with this when I first heard it, folks. I probably should be opening my mouth now, but anyway, uh, I've started. Uh, that God is not as much a God of our future as he is the God of our past. And that when we reflect on the things that God has done in our past and the promises that he has kept in our past, we can then trust and have hope and be able to nail our colours to the mast, if you like, on him for the future. Actually, I could sit down now, Neil, couldn't I? So, anyway, so you know, I struggle with that, but, but that's the God that we serve. The God who, and, and you listen to anything in the New Testament when they're standing, standing up, especially when they're talking to the, to the church leaders and saying, boy, you, you, guys, you guys have so got this wrong. Because they said, this is what happened here and here and here and here and God came through every single step of the way and all of this is pointing to that and you missed it and you missed it anyway I'm not preaching on that this morning I had the choice to do so but then we got um, the other uh, opportunity that I had was to preach on St Thomas and I'm thinking that was actually the first sermon I ever gave was here on the 31st of January 2016 was on St Thomas uh, patron saint of, of this church um, and anyway I said to the Lord well I don't know how many times I've preached on this Lord you know is there anything actually what can I bring that's going to be of an encouragement and he said trust me and he's been good in the past and so I will trust him here again in the future so we're going to read the scripture together as we jump into the story of uh, so appallingly named Doubting Thomas. As we, so we're going to read this together. So here we go. So all, all big voices. Here we go. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for the fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So we're going to pause there before we go any further into this uh, scripture and we're going to just have a little look because I've said many times in the past that we need to look at the context of what's happening what's happened so so when the scriptures for example says on the evening of that first day of the week they got together and um, who can tell me because this is it's the first day of the week this is the evening of, the, of what we call Easter Sunday. This is the evening of the day that the Lord has risen. This is, this is the evening of that. So who can tell me what you might think was the hot topic going on around the table? Mm -hmm. 
We've heard that he's risen. He wasn't there. And the angel said he's risen as he said he would. And Peter's had a Peter's been into the tomb and there's no one there. Mary met the gardener and then realized that it was Jesus. So that's the hot topic. But I want you to note one word in there that jumped out at me, and I've said to you many times before that if a word jumps out at you, pause to find out what the Lord's trying to say. Here's that word. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together. On the evening of that first day of the week. It wasn't just any first day of the week. See where I'm going with this? It's not just every word in Scripture is there for a purpose. It wasn't just any old first day of the week. It was on that first day of the week. That first day of the week. The week of the rising of Christ. The fulfilment of the prophecies. The promises of Christ. It was that first day of the game changer. The world changer. The truth maker. The event of all events in history. Friends, of all the events in the entire history of this planet, it was on that day that we're talking. That day. The day when the world got broken into the befores and the afters. The are you with me or are you not? It's that day. Friends, every word in Scripture is so important if we would just work our way through it and listen to what the Holy Spirit says as we read through it. It was on that first day of the week. That's what it was. And the doors were locked. And I thought to myself, fair enough, I'd probably lock the doors too. I'd probably lock the doors too. One needs to remember that that day has happened. Mary has had conversation with Rabboni, but nobody else has. Peter's seen the empty tomb, but not met the Christ. So they're still behind a locked door. Let's cut them some slack. The Romans wouldn't have been too happy that they mucked up and, and, and the body was flogged, was stolen. The church were now packing themselves because the body's not there any longer and they want to find out who... Who's seen the movie The Risen? Did I ask that last week? And? Yeah, so much going... It's an amazing movie you know the church in fact what the romans did was they act oh no i'm not gonna i'm not gonna say what so it's an incredible uh, understanding of what happened from that day forward uh from the position of the romans so i don't blame them for being behind the locked doors we're going to cut them some slack it was it was um it would have been pretty full on what was happening in jerusalem at that day and so we can understand it and then Jesus came and stood before them and said, Peace be with you. This, who's saying this? The Prince of all peace. The Prince of peace is saying peace. He brings peace. He exudes peace. Peace just pours out of him. The peace that passes all understanding is from Christ. The type of peace that reminds you the type of peace, the type of shalom, shalom to peace is the same as whānau is to family. Whānau means far more than family. Peace me, um, shalom means far more than just peace, as in a quiet morning. This is, this is an overwhelming peace that passes all understanding. The type of peace that reminds us that, that if Jesus is for us, then woe betide anyone who comes against us. It's that kind of peace. The type of peace that enables martyrs to stand before tyrants and receive um, death. The peace that has dismantled empires, changed hearts, overthrown kingdoms. That's the peace we're talking about. Not, g'day fellas, how's your morning going? It's peace 
that he's speaking. Shalom, peace be with you. And then Jesus does this. He proves his identity. He says, look, these are the scars of sacrifice for you guys. It's me. This is who I am. And the disciples were overjoyed. I think they suddenly realised that they'd backed the right horse. They were vindicated for their, albeit lacklustre, trust and for their witness thus far. They were vindicated that the Christ had indeed risen. They saw the Christ standing before them. Their devotion was about to be rewarded. They got their mission. And they not only got their mission, but they got their ammunition. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was given to them to resource them, to enable them to go for it, to know that Christ was indeed with them by his Spirit. Nothing will stop the purposes of God. So for a few minutes, in threes or fours, what does receiving the Holy Spirit mean to you? Just in threes or fours, what does receiving the Holy Spirit mean to you? Just get together just for a few minutes and then we'll, we'll come back and see what people think. Just another minute or so. What does receive the Holy Spirit? As we come back together, what does receive the Holy Spirit mean? Anyone? It's not mandatory. I just thought I'd give everybody an opportunity to, to share with each other and to be able to bring back, if you like, Emma. Are you just stretching your hand? Okay. Are you a wee trick, Emma? You're a wee trick. No one? Okay, that's all right. We can move on. I, um, uh, a number of years ago, uh, we used to get together on Sunday nights and we used to go to uh, about four or five of us pastors, uh, opened our churches up on a Sunday night and we would go to each other's church each Sunday and we used to rotate ourselves around uh, the churches and it was really good. And, uh, you know, one Sunday night I was at a church. It wasn't here. It was uh, down at another one. And uh, we were ministry. We were doing ministry afterwards, and we did prayer ministry. And this uh, lady came up to me, and um, I uh, asked her what she wanted prayer for, and she said, "I want prayer for the eczema on my hands." She had really quite bad eczema on on the lower part of her forearms, and I know how uncomfortable that is because I had that as a child, and it's just her. You know, anyone who's got it's just horrific. It's horrible, and. Um, so anyway, so she put her hands out like that, you see, and I just held on to the tips of her fingers. And as soon as I held on to the tips of her fingers, uh, I had these words fall out of my mouth. And the words that fell out of my mouth were, I am not going to pray for you unless you promise that you will receive the healing that God is about to give you. And she went, excuse me? And I said, I said, I'm not going to pray until you promise that you'll receive the healing. And she started crying. And she said, I can't do that. And I said, why not? And she said, because I'm not worthy to receive the Spirit of God. And I'm sitting there going, what have we as pastors or we as fellow Christians missed in our witness to her that we are worthy? He gave up his life for us. It says, and John clearly says, Anna's going to so tell me off from off script. The Gospel of John clearly says 
for God so loved the world. Now read the end of John's Gospel. He says, and so much else happened. Well, there's just not enough room to write it all down. And that's why, and when it says that God so loved the world, John's put the word world in there, or the Holy Spirit has inspired him to put the word world in there because he can't fit in everybody's names, including yours and including mine throughout history. For God so loved and then put all the names in. And I was so deeply moved by this. Well, first of all, the honesty of this lady. And she was before the Lord, she knew that. Receive the Holy Spirit. How much more does God want to give to us than we who are parents know how to give to our kids? How much more God wants to give? And so Jesus breathed on them and filled them with the Holy Spirit. So we move on. These disciples, uh, you've got to remember at this meeting there's only 10 of them. Judas has already done the business and Thomas isn't there. Probably out getting the milk or something. Thomas isn't there. So there's only the 10 of them. They were given mission. They were resourced with the Holy Spirit. And I tell you what, friends, I tell you what, how I would love for this part, portion of Scripture to end here. How cool would it be to end here? How cool would it be for Scripture to go on and say, and then the merry gaggle of disciples trip trop trapped their way throughout the land, spreading glad tidings of great joy. And the world heard their words and were all transformed and inquired of the Christ and welcomed him into their lives. Wars became a thing of the past. Disease was no more. Everyone lived happily ever after. Amen. <laughs> Guess what, saints? Sandy, what's happened? Can you click it on, please? I don't know why this isn't working now. It didn't happen then. But friends, there is a witness of the possibility of what can happen. And we read about it in John 4, where an entire village came out to meet him because of what that woman said. Why this isn't working now, Sandy? You're going to have to click it on when I say. Next one, that's it. Let's read that. Let's read it together. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. Because of his words, many more became believers. Also in Mark 2, it says that Jesus came home to Capernaum. That's quite interesting. It says in the scriptures that he came home to Capernaum. And he, Oh, no, that's the wrong one. That's it there. It says that he came home to Capernaum when he was surrounded by so many people that couldn't fit into the house, the friends of a paralyzed man cut a hole in the roof and lowered the sick man down. The sick man was forgiven of all he had done and stood and healed and took his bed home. It must have, surely, at least, had an impact on the neighbours, if nobody else, and probably would have been the talk of the marketplace for years to come. Next one. Then all... The people of the region of Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. In this story here, Jesus had sent the legion of demons from the man who was possessed, had sent them into a herd of pigs. He had upset the locals' equilibrium. He had upset their life rhythm by turning up and exhibiting the power of God. They asked Jesus to leave. 
Jesus was the reason that they were so upset. He was ordered to leave. I can just imagine them moaning. Struth, Jesus has turned up. What a mess. We were comfortable with things until he arrived. And so what did Jesus do? So he got into the boat and he left. Let those with ears hear. And this story could have finished there. But we read on. Thanks, Sandy. The man who had been freed from the demons begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him home, saying, No, go back to your family and tell them everything God has done for you. So he, the healed man, went all through the town proclaiming the great things Jesus had done for him. This is exactly the same as when um, Peter, James and John were up on the mountain of transfiguration. They saw Jesus in his divinity. They saw Moses and Elijah there. And what did they say? Let's go on mission. Come on, we've got to go and tell everybody what we've seen. No. Peter said, why don't we build a church and stay here? I want to build a shelter and stay here. The theme running through this. The list goes on. This is the example I hoped we would see amongst those mighty men of God. Surely all those who have encountered Christ have changed forever. Thanks, Andy. For example, like in Genesis 32, when Jacob encounters God. Let's read that together. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go until you bless me. Next slide. Thanks, Andy. Jacob became Israel. Scripture goes on to say, The sun rose above him as they passed Paniel, and he was limping because of his hip. He never walked the same. Jacob's identity was changed, and he even walked differently when he encountered God. Everyone saw something different in this man. And isn't that the way that it's meant to be for all who encounter Christ. Surely, surely people in the streets would be saying, wow, what happened to you? I don't know what it is, but I want what you've got. Isn't that what happens? Isn't that the cry of our hearts when we have an encounter with the risen Christ? Well, apparently not for these guys. And so we read on. Thanks, Andy. We're all read together. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. We'll pause there for a moment because I'm really, really trying hard here to wonder how they said that. We have seen the Lord. Did they go... Were they excited? We've seen the Lord. Excited? Were they encouraging? We've seen the Lord? Or was it na 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 na? We've seen the Lord. I don't know. What do you think? How did they say it? Also, it seems that Thomas wasn't as concerned about being arrested by the authorities as the others were because he wasn't behind the locked door. So he can't have been as concerned as everybody else was. Maybe he had even believed what Mary had so excitedly said earlier in the day. I have seen the Lord. And he believed her and thought, goodness, that's what he said he'd do. Praise God. Or maybe he was convinced that Peter had found the tomb empty, that Jesus had indeed risen. I don't think Thomas 
was actually a confident, faithful disciple. But we do need to be cautious of our understanding of Thomas because he then says what the others and probably 80% of those around us in this community would still say to this day. He then says what the others, in other words the disciples, and probably around 80% of the community here in Motueka would say if they were told we have seen the Lord. They would say what? Give us proof. Thanks, Sandy. But he said to them, read, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Isn't that exactly what Jesus did with the disciples? A part of me sees the disciples nervously laughing or scuffing the floor and nudging each other going, Thomas, Thomas, do you doubt that we saw him? Really? Jesus and us are like this, Thomas. We're, we're like this. I think they were starting to recognise that there was something bigger going on here. Because the challenge to us all and to the church and to the understanding of verses 21 and 22 when Jesus presented to the disciples his hands and his side. Read on. We read on. Thanks, Sandy. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Though the doors were locked. The doors were still locked. And yet, Jesus still turns up and says, Peace be with you. Nowhere in Scripture is recorded that he, walk, that he turns up and turns around and goes, Oh my goodness, the door's still locked. He doesn't. He comes in and he says, Peace be with you. The grace that is exhibited by our Lord is, probably not the grace I'd exhibit, but the grace that he exhibits is as one would expect of a God who loves us. Aren't you thankful? that Jesus didn't pay any attention to the locked doors. Doesn't he, pay, he actually doesn't pay any attention to our locked doors either. Doors that sometimes we pretend are keeping people out, people out and keeping us safe when sometimes actually they are hemming us in and stopping us from our destiny and our purpose. So often we have locked doors because it's from unfounded fear. Here we see Jesus still desires to meet the excluded, those who weren't there, the Thomases of this world, those left out, those disenfranchised. And friends, we need to recognise here that even when we aren't as tuned into Christ as much as we might think that we are, pretend or desires to be, Jesus still turns up. Those ten, as I said before, because Judas wasn't with them any longer, Thomas wasn't there that morning, those ten had miraculously met the risen Christ. The risen Christ. On the day that he had risen. On the day that he had risen from a very public and very terminal death, I might say. Just as he said he would. Jesus proved it was him with his hands on his side. He breathed on them. And this, I had to stop. I cried when I read this. He breathed on them. The Ruach of God. The breath of God. The same breath that created the universe. Friends, this is huge. Jesus is standing in a room with these ten and the breath that created the universe, he breathed on them. He filled them with the Holy Spirit. He commissioned them to go into all the world. 
They were bragging to, to Thomas that they had seen Jesus and Thomas hadn't. And yet, they're still sitting behind a locked door. Is it me? Is it just me? Or are there some questions needing answers here? Despite our locked doors, friends, despite maybe even our apathy to our call, our Laodicean acceptance of the divine experiences that we've had, look that up in Revelation 3, Jesus still meets those who earnestly seek him. He meets them at their point of need. Remember, he showed the disciples the scars and the wounds. He showed the disciples the scars and the wounds. Now he invites Thomas to experience the scars and the wounds. When he was with the disciples, he showed them. When he was with Thomas, he said, put your hand here. Stop. Next slide, please. Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Jesus impacted Thomas's heart, not just his head. And then I wonder if the disciples have suddenly now realised their apathy and their lukewarm response to the incredible gift Jesus had breathed on them. Have they suddenly been reminded by Thomas of the opportunity they had missed. Because listen to what Thomas says. Thanks, Andy. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Friends, Thomas said it. The disciples didn't. Thomas said it. The disciples didn't. Not even... The mighty Peter, recorded in Matthew 16, thanks Andy, saying, Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said nothing when the risen Christ stood before them. The only response we have recorded is a week later, and they are still behind a locked door, thanks Andy. My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. We are surrounded, friends, by those who have not seen, and yet there are things happening that have them questioning and are curious. I've mentioned before, I just went into a shop, and a guy said to me, oh, hey, you're a Christian, I've got this question, and then asked me a question about it, and by the grace of God, I was able to give him an answer. We have the good news and the hope. We have the anointing. And friends, we have the commission. The challenge is for us to question why Thomas has been labelled as the one who doubts. Why is Thomas the one who gets labelled as the one who doubts when it's too easy for us to measure people with our own measure? I find that the description of Thomas is rather arrogant, it's shallow, and maybe it is even said from a position of shame and fear of our own shortcomings. Because I believe that Thomas was honest and genuine. I will not believe it until I see it. Thomas only knew what he knew. Thomas only knew what he knew. And then, when he knew what he then knew, he was able to say, my Lord and my God. Thanks, Sandy. My Lord and my God. Let us pray. Let us pray for ourselves. Let us pray for our mission. Pray for our witness. And ask for a fresh revelation of God's grace and favour towards us. 
Come, Holy Spirit, as we bring our prayers to you this morning. He is Lord, He is Lord, He is risen from the dead, and He is Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue. 
before he died. Jesus gathered his friends together around a table. He took the most hum- humble element on that table, a simple loaf of bread. And he gave it eternal significance when he said to them, This is my body. It's given for you. Take and eat, all of you. Do this to remember me. Then after supper, he took the cup. When he given you thanks, he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sin. Take and drink, all of you, and do this to remember me. I ask now for your spirit to come, to rest on this bread and this wine, to fill them with the fullness of Jesus. Pray, Lord, that that same Spirit will rest on each of us. Come, Holy Spirit. Enabling us to come to God as God desires to come to us. So please come, receive from Him this morning. God has invited you here this morning. He invites you to His table. Please come, receive from Him. So if we traffic flow this way and through, please come receive from him this morning. Let us say together the prayer. Pray after Father, Lord, if you give thanks to Christ, if you give us the power, and let us sing the song, 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 a couple of notices first one is that the engaged gathering is happening tonight here at five o'clock um, so we meet in the foyer uh, and it's a finger food uh, meal just bring something to share and we just all throw it together as we do and um, so we're meeting out there and uh, it'll be wonderful. Um, five o'clock and we're all home by seven. Uh, that's Messy Church for uh, Anzac Day. Lest we forget, lest we forget the sacrifice that our soldiers uh, made on our behalf, but let us never forget the sacrifice that Christ made on our behalf. I kind of think of Anzac Day as very much a secular Easter because we celebrate, and rightfully so, the sacrifice made by our men and women folk of the Defence Forces, uh, which is Easter. It's Easter. Um, but uh, that's for the sin of the world through uh, Christ on the cross. So that's our messy church, Easter, April 25th. Um, Philippa and Gary uh, I won't be at that one. We are still obviously looking for helpers, if anyone... Would give us anything we need to know, Carol? All good? Spag bowl. Is it a spag bowl? 
Oh, you're not here for it, are you? No. Yes, you did. Emma. Oh, okay. Which is where? Sorry? Yes, I, I know where your place is, but nobody else does. 42 Angle Street. Down. Alright. Oh, okay. Oh, for the Messy Tuesday night. Alright. Okay. They, those people know who they are. Thanks for that, Emma. That's good. Nothing else we need to know? Fine. No? Good as gone. Okay. I get overwhelmed by. Um, Or how much uh, God cares for me. Uh, scripture says that, uh, it says in the Psalms, uh, you who created the heavens and the earth, the stars and the planets and the sun, everything that there is, uh, how is it that you're mindful of me? Um, and, uh, and he is. He is. By his grace, he is mindful of us. He has our name written on the palm of his hand. He thinks of us every second of every day and desires for us to walk in the purposes that he laid out for us before the foundations of this planet were even laid down. He had a plan and a purpose. So amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Oh, amazing grace. Sandy, let's say together, we thank you Lord, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, to fast to that which is good, to render no one evil for evil, to strengthen the faint hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honour everyone and love and serve the Lord, we go from here this day rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit, go in peace. And Lord, we pray for our first responders. 
to whatever this call out is, that the person who's in trouble will know your closeness and that you will be with those who are attending this uh, situation on our behalf. We praise you and thank you for them, Lord. Amen. Amen. Bless your saints. Hope to see some of you tonight.